This uh, next session is teaching nine and ten year olds how to code, which is, um, I'm quite looking forward to this since my son is just starting to learn. Um, please welcome Robert Ansell. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, so the talk's called Teaching Nine to Ten Year Olds to Code, um, and it's basically the story of how I ended up over the last year and a half teaching a bunch of kids at my local primary school how to code. Um, you know, I want to kind of share some of the experiences I had doing that, so anyone else who might be interested in starting up a code club could maybe get some ideas, and also kind of give a perspective and the things I learned uh, seeing coding from a kid's perspective. So a little bit about me. So this is my fourth LCA I've been to, uh, but first time talking, so it's cool to be on the other side. Um, I work on the Ubuntu desktop team for Canonical, which is the company behind Ubuntu. Um, I work from home in Napier, it's a city up north in New Zealand. Um, the talk doesn't relate to my uh, Canonical work, but I have a boss who lets me sneak out on Thursday afternoons to, to do this. Um, so I got into Ubuntu by being part of a GNOME developer, so I've been GNOME de developer for longer. Um, yeah, and I'm still active, active hacker there. Worked on all sorts of bits and pieces across that stack. I uh, actually did my degree here. So uh, last time I was here before LCA, I think I was sitting up there in an 8 a.m. stats lecture, which I <coughs> stopped going to after a while because it was 8 a.m. Um, I also, as you can probably see, I, I'm not a teacher, so I haven't got any teaching background, but I've, I've long had an interest in doing some teaching, and that's kind of what drove me to Code Club. So. For those who don't know, Code Club's an international organization uh, set up to teach uh, children how to code. Um, it's part of the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Uh, there's Code Club Aotearoa, which is the, the sort of New Zealand entity that runs Code Club here. Uh, and for those who don't know, Aotearoa is the Maori name for New Zealand. It can be used interchangeably. So one day we'll use it officially and then we'll bypass Australia in alphabetical order. Uh, the great thing about Code Club is everything's organized for you. So there's a ton of material for teaching. Um, they have a website, you can set your club up, advertise it, that sort of thing. They do things like police background checks. So you know, you're going teaching kids, obviously there's, there's potential issues there, so they cover all that for you, so you, you know everyone's safe. Um, and then there's people behind it. So like when I started, I had a phone call with someone who kind of talked me through, and I was like, oh, how does this work? And they're like, no, that's cool, you better work it out. Um, so yeah, so once I found out about this and thought, oh, maybe I'll give it a go, I went down to the local primary school that my kids go to, and I talked to the principal, and I said, you know, would you guys be interested? And yeah, they were keen. So um, one hour a week after school in the library, we, we set it up for that, and uh, I just asked the principal, can you, can you find me some kids? He said, yeah, I'll get some kids. <laughs> um, yeah, and I've been running for the last year and a half. So to run a code club, you need volunteers. So I was volunteer number one in the club. It started out with just me and 15 kids. Um, that was yeah, a little bit daunting, as you can imagine. So I, I found someone else. I found a, a friend I had met through the school who was a parent of one of the kids. Yeah, um, he was a teacher. So that was awesome, because kind of the combination of, of me knowing the coding, him knowing the teaching, so, yeah, it works really well, and the Code Club actually recommends that. So, um, yeah, that was definitely a good idea. And by the end of uh, last year, we had uh, four volunteers and about 15 to 20 kids, depending on who turned up, and that, that seemed about the right sort of mix. So, straight from day one, I was very interested in making sure we got diversity right. So, obviously, there's different things of diversity. There's like uh, rich kids, poor kids, um, ethnic backgrounds and gender. Um, I was trying to think, well, maybe should we have a quota? How are we going to do this? Uh, this is really hard. Luckily, we basically got a 50-50 male-female mix straight away, which was awesome, so I didn't have to do much. Although, over the year, the girls started to drift away. And it, um, yeah, they, they left for various reasons. They, they said, oh, I've got other things on, or you know, I'm just not into it or whatever. And though no one ever said it was kind of as they were becoming a minority, I kind of felt that was the problem occurring. Um, so there was just the two of us running it at the t volunteers running at the time. He, he's, a, he's a man as well. 
we were really worried. It was, it was kind of this kind of this boys club where it was kind of boisterous boys, and that was maybe putting people off. And the worst point was uh, there was a Shikan Code Week, which was a sort of a promotional competition thing where the clubs could enter. And we literally lost the last girl the week before, and we couldn't even enter it. So that was a bit, uh, a bit bad. So, so what can we do about this? So I went to, went to the school and said, can you get all the senior girls to come in one lunchtime, and I'll, I'll try to sell it to them. So I got, got all my raspberry pies and flashy things and everything I could find, got them all to come in. I said, this is Code Club, it's awesome, and we, want more, we want more girls involved, and you know, come and sign up. Um, and I didn't know how it would go, but we got basically straight up to 50-50, straight up to a 50-50 mix again. So that, that was awesome. Um, and then we also, uh, we wrote in the school newsletter and we said we want female volunteers, we want role models uh, to help out. So uh, my wife uh, came along, we worked out some babysitting with the grandparents and that was good. And then one of the other mothers of school kids said, if nobody else signs up, I'll sign up. And we went, gotcha. <laughs> yeah, and we, and we managed to hold that uh, gender balance for the whole rest of the year. So, so it was interesting that it, yeah, it felt if you, if you weren't on top of it, it could fall apart. But the demand was there, and if we, if we actively worked at it, we could, uh, we could keep that together. So volunteers, kids, probably going to need some computers. So I thought, when I first thought about this, I thought, well, what do I do in primary school? What, uh, schools have computers, right? They've got computer labs. No, they don't have computer labs. They got rid of all those. Huh. Well, we could teach without computers, because there's UC Unplugged, and that's quite cool. But you know, I feel like we'll, you know, we won't get that, that far. So. What else can I do? Ah, maybe we can get some old computers. There's plenty of old donated equipment I can get. I was involved in a, a digital archiving organization that, that they had computers. I thought, we'd get some of those. But then, well, as well as the school's not having any computers, they haven't got anywhere to put any computers. And we're not going to cart computers in every week. So what can we do? Ah, it's the new world. It's bring your own device. Kids have got computers. Cool. We'll get them to bring their computers in. So what are you, computers you got? Oh, everyone's got a Chromebook. So how are we going to do coding? I mean, all the coding I do day to day is, is on command lines and I've got things installed. Can you code on the web? I don't know. So can we do it? Yes, we can. So there's a website called Scratch, which is designed for learning coding. Um, this is kind of the recommended starting point from Code Club. It's uh, block-based programming, so it's all drag and drop. It's very visual, uh, loads of course materials available from Code Club, and, and also all over the web, there's lots of YouTube tutorials and things. So started off with, sorry, started off with this, um, yeah, worked pretty well to start off with. But as we used it more and more, I started to, uh, I don't really, there's things about this tool I don't like. So I found the kids would uh, plateau. After they kind of learned the basics, they were kind of, because the, the blocks are so kind of hard to manage, the structure gets out of control. Um, they, they find weird things really quickly, like race conditions. Because these things actually run in separate, um, effectively, threads, I guess. They go, oh, why is this not working? And I go, uh, oh, it's a race condition. Like, you shouldn't be covering this right now. <laughs> um, and, and then the thing that was good and bad was, because it's a website, it's got a sort of a sharing element where you can uh, see what other people are coding on. And so what would happen is everyone would go, ah, what are the most popular things other people are working on? Really elaborate shooting games. So there'd be all these games which would be super like, complicated. They're just The kids are just playing games, basically. And then you go, OK, playing a game. Oh, that's cool. So how does it work? And they click on the code, and it's just a billion blocks. You're like, oh, yeah, you're not going to understand that. Or you know, can you modify it? And they're like, ah, uh, no. So yeah, I just thought it wasn't uh, wasn't uh, pushing these sort of coding skills. So the next thing we worked on was uh, Python. I thought, let's, let's get them onto Python. So one of the great things about Python is I could say, look, you know, look at this website. This website is written in Python. This is a, a real world thing. This is you know, real coding. Uh, it's, good, and it's, it's a powerful language, and it has a great reputation being easy to learn. So back to this initial problem. Can we do it from a browser, though? Yeah, you can do that as well. So, the website, there's a couple of websites that do this, but we ended up using this one called REPL.IT. Um, yeah, you can enter your program on the left, you can see the output on the right. Um, 
So a few things I found interesting when we got the kids into Python is, is the things that they find difficult that I'd never even thought about. So indentation is, is I knew that'd be reasonably difficult, but it, that's super hard for them to, to understand and really hard to describe. You're like, you know, go a few more spaces there and a tab there, and they're like, what? And they're pressing buttons all over and moving cursors and confusing. Um, syntax highlighting, like the colors, the kids immediately go, oh, how do I type in red? And you're like, no, no, the red, the red doesn't matter. That's just, oh, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> turn, turn the highlighting off. Um, and auto completion, yeah, you know, they're typing and then it's typing the code for them and they go, what? I didn't type that. But you know, they, get, they get past those things and they, and they, they can learn. Um, the one of the things also about Python, of course, is it's a bit less visual appealing. There's no things flying around that you can click on. So I had to find a challenge for them that would uh, encourage them to keep pushing into Python. So I thought I'd start something simple like steganography. <laughs> so steganography is the, the means of uh, hiding messages within other messages. So I wrote this little challenge up that would solve something steganography. I thought it was reasonably you know, achievable and I gave it to the uh, volunteer and he said, uh, no, no the kids, I can't even understand this. So I thought, oh, damn, okay. So I thought, well, it's, it's doable if you, if you know the steps, but obviously the understanding it is hard. So I took all the steps to do it and made them into separate projects before. So the kids would learn all the bits to, to solve it and then they put them all together. So this is what the, it looks like. Oh, sorry, this is the steps. So these are the, I made these up. These are all Creative Commons licensed. Um, and they're all learning little concepts. Um, so these are different to the materials we'd had elsewhere, and they were based on looking at how they learned. So a lot of the other material from Co Club was very step by step. would say, write this line, here's what it does. Write this next line, here's what it does. And that was good that the kids could follow it, but often they didn't seem to really, they were just following it without thinking. And they would do things like, all come up and say, oh, this doesn't work. And you go, did you read the next line? No, or it says there. And you're the third kid to ask me that. So they weren't really thinking about why it worked. So this is something I, I tried. Um, so one thing, everything fits on one piece of paper. So they're not getting confused by you know, bits of paper and stuff. And then I, I just throw them in the deep end, basically. I have the top, I say, write this program. Here's like a six line program, just, just write it in. And then I, and the next question is, what do you think it'll do? So just, just have a think about it and then run it. And then the bit after that is the description. It says, well, what we're doing is this, and this is why. And then the last bit is some sort of uh, questions to challenge them. It says, you know, how would you change it to do this? How would you change it to do that? And it's kind of three things that get harder and harder. And, and not all the kids did all the extra ones, but you know, the, most kids did the first one, and the kids who were really into it to kind of get to the third one. So here, here's, here's the, the challenge that I gave them. It was. Uh, a file like this. It was already in REPL, they didn't have to type it in. Um, and I said to them, that would have been mean, yeah. Count all the ones and zeros. And what I liked about this problem was a lot of the, the other problems you get are so simple, the kids just go, oh, I can do that by hand. You know, you say, add three numbers, they go, well, I just added them up. You know, but do it with the computer. You know, there's more numbers here than they can do by hand reliably. Uh, so write a little program, it's, it's faster. And then the idea was that when they counted the numbers, they might see, ah, hang on, there's some other things in here. And they get those other characters, put them together, they get a, get a sentence, and the sentence says, hey, what's ASCII? And so I'd previously told them about binary, and I told them about character sets, so I said, well, ASCII is a seven-bit character set. Okay, so take those ones and zeros and break them into groups of seven. That was a, another project they'd already done, breaking things up. Convert it to a number, that was a project they'd done. Get the number to a letter, dot, dot, dot. A few more steps in it, a few more little thick puzzles, and you get a URL out there. So I threw them into a Monty Python uh, video. So I actually picked something they were into at the time when I did the tutorials. They were actually playing some Monty Python videos, which I thought was quite funny. Um, sadly, by the time they solved the puzzle, they'd all forgotten that, and they were like, oh, what's this? So uh, yeah, you can't be cool to kids. <laughs> um, so now, yeah, so now the kids have completed some Scratch and some Python. Um, and, and I wanted to move on to the next stage. So one of the things that I felt like, by doing everything in a web browser, it felt almost like an app, I think, to them. They, they perhaps losing the idea that coding was fundamental to everything. So I wanted to move on to the next thing. Get, had, some, had a Raspberry Pi at home, so I bought a Sense hat, which is this board on the top, 
because there's some lights and things to control. They can control it all through Python, but, but they can see it. They can see the chips, they can see the processor. You know, and it, was, it worked. When they got it, they just treated it like a different thing. They're like, oh, look at this. this. And actually, it was, you could, the thing that told me that they saw it differently was with one kid in the class who had been doing Python for a while, and he said, I hate Python. I'm not doing it today. I'm not doing Python. He went down, he sat on the Raspberry Pi, and did Python. He had no idea it was the same thing. It, to him, it was just a different thing. But yeah, it's, you know, that sort of mind shift. Uh, so I wrote some content in the same form as the other content I had, so they had something to keep going on to. Um, so yeah, we had one Raspberry Pi, which was a shame because we had 20 kids and one Pi. And it was a pain to set up because we were just borrowing the, um, the monitor in the library. That was a kind of like cheating to set up. So I thought, well, what can we do? So I looked around for a solution to that. I found this product, which is called the PyTop Seed. Um, so it basically turns your Raspberry Pi into a little, little, little computer. Um, so you can still access and see everything down the bottom, but it's, it's got a screen, you can carry it around. It cost us around 200 bucks. I thought, eh, I haven't really got that much money lying around for this. I can't charge for Code Club, which is good because it means everyone can have a go, but we haven't got any money coming in. So I'll try to get some charity funding, but we're not a legal entity, and, and some charities were like, you know, we give grants of $10,000. I'm like, I want a grant of $400. Doesn't really match. Um, yeah, and I, I reached out to some of the local companies, but didn't really get much of a response. So one evening I thought, oh, stuff it. I'll just set up a give a little page, and maybe it'll work. I don't know. Um, I did that. You know, that was just sort of you know, an hour's work. Um, and then I just emailed all the, all the parents of the kids and, and went on social media and kind of friends and family said, you know, can you throw 20 bucks in? And yeah, we got $580. So that was a really easy way to get some money. I uh, bought two PyTop seeds, uh, another Raspberry Pi, a few extra little bits and bobs. So now we had two computers, PyTops we could set up, easy. Uh, later on, I found another way of getting stuff. So there's a website called Element, a company called Element 14. They're an electrical component supplier. So I bought stuff from them before. Um, and I found that on their community site, they have a thing called Rotest Reviews, where they offer um, equipment. They send it to you for free. All they ask is you do a, an unbiased review on their website. Um, so I looked on there, and they were doing something called the, I think it's called the Great BBC Microbit Education Giveaway. Give you a box of 10 microbits. So yeah, all right, I'll try for that. Um, I bought one of these previously in the year, and uh, I thought it was a really cool product. Um, I thought, yeah, that'd be cool to have a classroom set of those. And applied and got it, which was awesome. So I got 10 of those coming. And then I thought, well, if we had 20, that'd be better. So I did another crowdfunding, got the money for that. So we had a, had a full set. So this is the BBC microbit, the front and the back, if no one's ever seen one before. So it's a small microprocessor. Um, now this is, this is interesting. I remember when this came out, and I was reading the blog post about it, I thought, oh, I don't really get this product. Like it's, it's like a Raspberry Pi, but it doesn't do Wi-Fi. <laughs> And it's, yeah, I don't know, it just doesn't seem like a, a good product. And then since I was teaching the kids, I suddenly realized this is a super clever product. Like, when we had those Raspberry Pis, we had to buy the hats to go on them. So they ended up being a bit more expensive and a bit more complicated. This has all the input and output built into it. You've got 25 LEDs there, got some buttons, accelerometer. Um, the other thing is that it's cheap. It's like $25 roughly per one. You know, if, if one breaks, it's just not the end of the world. Uh, really easy to program. You just drag and drop over onto USB, so any of these computers that we were using could, could do it. Um, rugged, yeah, really, really strong. Like, kids stood on one, cut her foot, but the microbus survived. <laughs> the, uh, the school nurse said, I thought, I thought you guys were teaching them coding. How have you, <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> Um, and, and students can grow with the device. You can start out doing uh, stuff similar to Scratch, but you can attach electronics on the bottom, you can go to different low-level languages. So that's pretty cool. Uh, so this is the, the website we use to program them. It's called Make Code. It comes from Microsoft. Uh, it's you know, so very similar to Scratch. Um, also on the left, you can see you've got a, a simulated microbit, which is cool, because you can actually do it all without a microbit. Like the kids could go home, they could still do it and come back and try the microbits in class. 
Uh, so the other thing is uh, robotics. So schools seem to love robotics. Uh, all the schools seem to go out and buy really expensive robots that they have conned into buying, I think. And I, I just don't get it. I, I don't see the educational value in them. They often look, seem really fragile. Or they don't really do much. So once you've kind of got it moving, you haven't done anything. So I was look, trying to work out what was a cost-effective robot I could get in the class that was, you know, would give some value. So the first one I got was the STS Pi on the left, with, and I got that to go with the Raspberry Pis. But I could never work out how to get the kids of this age group to use it. So, so you can see the Raspberry Pi in there. The issue is that you're either going to have to connect a power cable and a monitor and a keyboard, and then it doesn't really drive around anymore, or you're going to have to secure a shell into it, and then they're going to have to understand what shell is. And there's so many layers before they can even get the thing to move. Uh, the one on the right is, is the Move Mini. Um, and I got this as a road test review, so sent for free, great. Um, it's controlled by a micro bit. So the kids who've been doing all these micro bit things can then plug it in here, they control the wheel. So it's a robot. Uh, and they can stick a pen on the top and draw shapes. So yeah, it, it seems like a, a really good product. It's a similar price to the uh, micro bit itself, so it's not, not too expensive. Uh, the other cool thing is, as, as a, oh, I didn't mention, did I mention before? Maybe not. The micro bits do Bluetooth communication between each other. So once you've got it driving around in a fixed program, you can get another micro bit and then have the two micro bits talk together with Bluetooth. One is the controller, one is the robot. You're controlling the whole thing. It's not like you're installing an Android app that's doing all the you know, in input for you. you can, so we had, a, we had one where you could tilt a micro bit, and that would make the robot move around, or you could use the buttons to speed it up and down. It's just endless possibilities. So halfway through the year, kind of learned about the new digital curriculum in New Zealand. Uh, the bit that's relevant to us is called computational thinking. Um, the curriculum is, is uh, even harder to read than that. It uh, took a long time to find. When I found it, it was pretty hard to understand. But luckily, the government's got a, an organization to make a video series called The Digital Passport. And that has um, some really ropey quality video dad jokes, but it explained it in ways you can understand. And I watched that, um, and, I, and I suddenly understood what it was about. And yeah, so that was available to all teachers for free. And luckily, because I was going through a school, they were able to get me onto that. Yeah, so the, it was interesting to see that most of what we were teaching kind of aligned with the curriculum, and it, it also meant that we adjusted some of our stuff to, to better fit into that. So the, it was, it's interesting that the kids we're teaching at the moment, I guess, will kind of be the last generation to miss out on this curriculum, because all the kids coming up behind them will hopefully already know a lot of this stuff. So we've been kind of focusing on how can we get these kids to kind of catch up to where they're missing out, and then over time, hopefully we'll be able to teach more and more interesting and complicated projects. So this was the card I got at the end of the year, which I thought was pretty cool. One of the uh, volunteers was a web developer. She set this up. Uh, so we finished up running the club at that school, decided to move on to another school. So the, the intention from the start was never to stay at one school. I thought I'd just try to kind of get the seat going. And so the, the school hopefully will continue. I'm not sure how they'll go with that. Um, they didn't actually provide a teacher. It was just us uh, volunteers who were running it. And I think that, that it's a real problem for the school because it makes it a lot harder for them to continue. Uh, so that we found another school in Napier, um, which is uh, less privileged. Uh, it's one of the poor, poorer schools. And we said, you know, can we come in and set one up there? And, and luckily they... <coughs> They're very happily providing a teacher, which will be cool, because hopefully we can get some of that knowledge transferred to them. And uh, yes, yeah, so, so the school has mostly uh, sporting activities previously, and they were, they've been trying to get new stuff in, so have, haven't been on it yet, but uh, hopefully we'll find out we'll get them this new, new thing going. Yeah, so, so the conclusion, uh, if, if you're interested in setting something like this up, it can be done. So when I started out, I wasn't sure it would work. I was just, you know, I wasn't from Co Club. I just found out about it. You can do it. It's it's surprisingly doable. Um, 
you can get funding. So while you don't need funding for everything to work, it's possible to get funding without, you know, it's not too hard. You can do crowd, crowdfunding, you can do these, these protest reviews. And the last bit is, is the market bit I can just really recommend. I feel it's, I've become a bit of a micro bit fanboy about it, really. It's just the, the right product, I think, to, uh, to teach kids coding and, and bridge them into other, other domains. And because it's such a, like a constrained platform, it focuses them. Where with other things, they, they can drift away. Because there's a limit to what they can do, they, they really sort of double down on it. Yeah, so there's some links at the end, and uh, any questions? We've got a bit of time for questions, so have we got any questions? What do you program in, in Microbit? What languages are available? Languages, so we use that make code, which is that drag and drop scratch style. Yeah, so there's also MicroPython available, um, but I haven't, we, we didn't move the kids onto that. We were still kind of maxing out the, the make code. Can you share a little bit more about the uh, individual meeting timelines, the, the plan? How often did you have those? What do they go? Like my own experience with an 8 and 10-year-old at home is uh, maintaining a level of interest. So how do you get them to commit to write something that's significant more than a blinky light? Right, yeah. So, uh, so the, we evolved over the whole year. But I th I'll talk about the, the last term. So New Zealand has four terms in a year. Uh, so in the last term, what we did one of the things we did, but I thought worked really well, was we made a leaderboard. So previously, we'd just kind of go on, here's a bunch of projects, you know, go for it. And then some kids would you know, want to do all of them, some would kind of peter out. But by putting a leaderboard up, we had 10 projects, and we said, you know, try to do them all. We, we picked a number we thought would work. We also said, you can't do the robots until you do the basics. So the robots sat there, and the kids, you know, oh, that looks like fun. Um, yeah. And when the first kids started using them, some of the other kids who weren't really going very fast went, oh, hang on, I have to do, and they did all the ones before. Yeah, and then, and then it just comes down to the subject matter, try, trying to pick uh, what relates to, you know, the kids uh, like. So to one of the, uh, the two microbit ones that were the best, where there was a, um, a magic eight ball, which was basically, you press the button and it was a random number generator, which would say yes, no, maybe. They, they loved that because the interaction between them. Uh, another one was there was uh, an electronics one where you had the, um, what's that? It's the patience game where you have a wire and you've got to try to go around it without bumping it. So they loved that and the tactile nature of that was really good. And then some of the later ones, I made some radio ones. I made a, like a voting one where you had all the microbits talk to each other and you, you did a vote. You said, you know, it, what's better, you know, apples or bananas? And then they'd all vote and so there's a kind of play element to it. You said that Scratch was limited because the blocks kind of got a bit unwieldy, but then you're using the block-based microbit programming. Was that different, or how, 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 did, how did that work? Yeah, so I think it worked better with the microbit because the, the outputs, inputs and outputs were less. So when you're only controlling 25 LEDs, your code only gets so complicated. When you've got a scene in Scratch with 20 um, sprites that come and go and, and clone. And, and the, other, the other thing about um, Scratch is the code's very uh, connected to each sprite, which you look at one sprite and you're missing 90% of the program. And then these bits should be sp shared between sprites, but that's actually surprisingly hard to do. Yeah, with the, with the micro bit, it's, it's one program that you can see. It's just that. But I, I think it, if you did a whole year of it, yeah, they would be have the same issues, they would have too much code that you'd want to get them onto MicroPython. I love the, uh, the creativity, your problem solving, you're finding interesting things for the kids to do. What sort of support network does Code Club give to the volunteers to share those ideas and, and come up with, with new and interesting things? Yeah, so there's, um, I mean, they have their Facebook groups, they've got mailing lists. I have to say, I didn't interact too much with the, the Code Club organization afterwards, kind of after setup. 
but they, they do have, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you can ring a number up and talk to someone. They've got staff. So that, that does surprisingly well um, equipped for it. I think they get a lot of support. Do you have plans to keep expanding in the future and possibly even going overseas, but at least expanding in New Zealand? So, so in terms of what I'm doing myself, um, I would like to see more co-clubs uh, crop up in Napier. So there's a few around, but um, yeah, the value to me, I think, is to kind of, I've got the coding skills to go out and try to help these skills kind of get started. Uh, hopefully this will improve with the new uh, curriculum where they're they are starting to pick up. And the schools are clearly struggling to understand the subject matter. Um, and, and a lot of it's just, they just don't know what they don't know. So for example, uh, one of my child's teachers, she said she bought a um, robotic mouse. And she said, I just picked this out of a catalog. Like she didn't really know what it did. And you program it in and it moves around. So you go left, right, up, down, and it goes left, right, up, down. And the kids were playing with it and they were just randomly putting stuff into it. I looked at the box and I said, where's the cards that come with it? And she said, oh, didn't know. So I found them under a table somewhere and I said, these are the most valuable thing in the box. So all the cards were is had all the instructions. And I said, the, the point of this is, is you lay out the instructions and then you put it in the mouse and then you see how it goes. And if it's wrong, you iterate. And then maybe you get two groups to do that. And maybe you, you mess their program up intentionally. And, and this is, the value's here in the thinking about the structure. And and once she, she got it, she was like, oh, and then, yeah, they ran with it and, and they, they built off it. And that was just something that, when you don't come from a coding perspective, I think they just couldn't see it. And it was cool to be able to help out with that. Yeah. Not a question here, but just quickly answering two of these points about Code Club, because I'm a little closer to them. Um, so it exists, Code Club also exists in Australia and in the UK, although they are not directly related, but the sort of concept is the same and collaboration is picking up between them and also in terms of what does Code Club do to um, support you. Um, I, I think the best answer to that would be um, maybe not enough yet and it is people such as yourselves that are doing fantastic work and making it real and tangible. So one thing that Code Club could be doing is making it easier for others to find resources such as this talk and, and so on. And I'll be certainly taking that on to, to the folks that are pushing Code Club in, in Aotearoa. And also, um, I don't know how many of you know this, but the Digital Futures Aotearoa program that is doing the ch children um, in the Orange Building downstairs is actually run by the guys from Code Club. So if you have specific questions, find them before the end of the conference. Just a mechanical thing. So you've got these 20 micro bits. Are you programming them through the Chromebooks with Web USB? Does that work yet? Or again? how are you programming the micro bit? Like how are the kids flashing the micro bits? Is it Web USB through the Chromebooks or drag and drop on the on the yeah? Oh, so it is okay. So that works now. Yeah. Cool. And then I also wrote a uh, I wrote a flasher for Ubuntu, so you could just click on the website and go straight there. So we we have some uh, donated machines that I installed Ubuntu on for the kids who don't have Chromebooks. Did you capture the um, work plans uh, for the overall course? Because you've obviously supplied a valuable lot of um, development. It'd be, I can see, you know, it could be very useful for uh, other groups to use what you've got. Yeah, so uh, they're just currently Google Docs, those ones there currently. Um, this is where my lack of teaching knowledge comes in. So my co-volunteer co who is a teacher, he's always more into like, documenting and putting things together into course materials. So I haven't done that yet, but um, yeah, I'd be totally, I'd, I'd, yeah. I'd, I'll, I'll write a blog post and link to them, but hopefully someone else can tie them all together. Other questions? No. Um, you talked earlier in the talk about how um, you had all of the female students drop out and then you got more again. Um, besides um, getting more, uh, well, increasing the diversity of volunteers, did you do anything else um, to try and retain those students after that? Like changing the um, teaching style or whatever? Uh, 
Yeah, well, I mean, getting the, the female role models, the other volunteers, that was, that was a big part, I think, that helped. Because um, it's, it's kind of hard, I think, to, yeah, for us you know, to say we want diversity, but when everyone is running it as a guy. So I think that was a, that was a big thing. Um, I, I've thought about mixing the groups, so, so the kids kind of separate along gender lines. Um, we never... We never got to doing that, but that was something I felt like maybe we should be doing projects and kind of get the kids to mix up. So part of it was that the whole thing was super experimental. We just changed the rules all the time, see how it went. And I felt that sometimes there were things that you'd ended up in that you didn't want to be in, but it was very hard to change them. Like in particular, uh, the, the helping style that I ended up doing was kind of like running around helping the kids. And I think if we'll try next year, or this year rather, is to be more um, you know, welcoming everyone, having more of a formal you know, summary at the end and stuff. And this yeah, things like that, I, we, you kind of just have to let it run a bit. Thanks. All right, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Okay.